Um, thanks, Ian, for joining us. Um, Kevin Robbins is another member of the board of the, the, uh, the Simplot Games. I think he's got, collected the uh, list of questions. Um, so, Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you. If Stacy and Ian, you guys are ready to go, let's start with some of the questions. And I hope also that. Uh, um, so anyway, the first one, I think you've answered already uh, because it was asked just slightly before you covered some of the video things. And it says, uh, this is from Howard Burnett. He says, I am familiar with Sergei Bubka's pole vaulting accomplishments, but what is the physical maneuver that you referred to as a Bubka? Okay, so we... When I was uh, first training, you know, I, there was no other female athletes to to watch. So my coach luckily had film of Sergey and um, Max Tarasov. So we would watch eight millimeter film from time to time to watch technical aspects of their jumps. And Sergey used to swing so aggressively on his pole. So, oh, I think everybody that's you know been a pole vaulter that I've been around has called the straight body swing that we swung um, to invert on the bar, we call that a swinging bubka. So just being really tight to that to that bar. Um, so I, I refer to that when we're on the bar to swing a full bubka. So there's a tap swing and then swing to invert is, is a swinging bubka. So thanks for asking that. Sorry, I didn't clarify that. Cool. Usually, you, you know, in gymnastics, I think these cool tricks and things are always named after the athlete that's, that's um, that's that's invented it. So Sergey was really known for his speed down the runway and how well he could connect with the pole. So we call anything that is inverted like that Sergey Bubka drills. <laughs> All, right. All right. This next question is from Januel Gomez. Question is: Are these gymnastic drills equally beneficial throughout the season, or are there certain points? like competition phase in which we would focus on the drills more than others? That, that's a good point. So um, like right now, my kids, this is the end of April. We are still using a lot of the elements, but we're, we're backing off on the volume. So early on through the fall, we would do more reps and that would be kind of our conditioning day, right? But now as our kids are getting ready for districts and state, we're not trying to do a lot of volume and tire them out. We just want to hit these elements quick and short and to the point. So right now, instead of three, three sets of five, we're doing two sets of three. So we don't have to do them all either per se, but I'll pick like right now in our training, um, we'll still do a lot of the warm up of the floor because it's just a great warm up base. And then we'll break off to the bars, we'll break off to the rings, break off to the rope. Maybe pick three or four of those drills that we think that are crucial for that athlete. And you can really tailor it to an athlete too. If they're struggling with one of those drills, whether it's doing a bubka or, um, um, you know, swinging on the rope, maybe they need to do, you know, one of those as um, elements more so than the other. So it's all about, um, I call it activation drills at this point in the season is just really trying to hit positions, touch it and get off of it. All right. Uh, I just got an email from Monty and he sent me the questions for Ian. So until I get those open and reading them, I'm going to go with another one from Januel. This one, um, how do we make sure that an increase in speed at the end of the season doesn't compromise technique? Um, so hopefully by increasing the speed, for me, when I, when I teach speed, it's on and off the runway. Our kids always run with the pole and without the pole off the runway before we even get on the runway to jump that day. So they're learning how to overspeed train off the runway so they can learn the pole drop as well. It's great to learn that speed, like you just said, but if you're not timing up the plant with the speed behind it, it could devastate the technique in the air, correct? So I have my kids run with and without the pole off the runway to make sure that that timing is coming together. And if it's not, then typically, like some of my kids are 
on our six step stride and their seven step stride. And some of our kids just aren't ready for their seven. They're falling apart coming into takeoff. So I know I need to keep them at their six step. So they're bringing the speed through the takeoff. Once I know they're bringing the speed through the takeoff, then I can try to advance them to that seven step to see if, if, if they would um, benefit from that speed. But if they're falling apart before they get to the takeoff, I know that they're not ready for it. So we do a lot of training off the runway before we get on the runway, because I think once they see that box in their face and they're on the runway trying to bring that speed and they're not ready for that timing, it's going to throw off the jump. So we do a lot of things, hitting a towel, hitting a slide box to try to time up the speed with the plant. All right. Now I've got these uh, questions for Ian. Um, the first one is kind of a fun one. It says, do you have a Yosemite Sam costume to go with that mustache for Halloween? <laughs> you know, I'll have to get one. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, when uh, Stacy and I had our, before we had our first girl, uh, I grew my beard out for a year and That's she horrible. hated it. But uh, yeah, a typical fireman mustache and you uh, you'd have a little facial hair to be manly for sure. <laughs> you're, you're not manly enough. <laughs> And here's a, a, a legitimate question here from Donovan. He says, why do we hold the discus in that way specifically? Yeah, I, I think uh, I got that question earlier. Um, we just talked about okay. uh, split the discus in half, and basically we're holding with our first two fingers and then splitting the rest apart, uh, basically for, for strength issues. And we have uh, a lot of force behind that discus. One finger isn't strong enough to hold it, and it causes a lot of wobbling issues. So just having more strength uh, with two fingers helps us uh, fly that discus correctly. And this other one from uh, Donovan, you may have uh, covered already, but he says, would there be any major differences in training for shot put and discus with regards to strength and agility? Yeah, I think they cross over pretty well. I mean, especially being in, in high school, we just want to get as strong as possible and incorporate the plyometrics, the sprints, uh, technical issues that go along with it. So there's there's a lot of cross training in there uh, as far as weightlifting and, and strength training. But when it comes down to obviously the technical part of the, the throws are going to be different. Um, your discus and your rotational shot put will overlap a little bit, but general uh, strength training, you can you can definitely overlap those. Cool. All right. Now, Stacy, this next question is the favorite one that I've seen so far. I really okay. like this one. What competition mindset is best for pole vaulting? Do we want our athletes to use their anger for max effort or to be calm and collected for sub-maximal effort? That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think any athlete is is very different. Um, I remember going to practice and using my anger. You know, I did horrible in school that day, and I had all this anger. Like, why did I screw up my test? So, you got to be able to change that energy into something that's beneficial for you. And I I'm thankful that I had track and field to vent my anger. And, you know, there were times that was helpful, but there's times that I brought too much anger to the table and I couldn't do anything that day. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a balance of anger um, and excitement. Um, if you're too excited, then it's hard to fill the positions. Um, and if you're too lackadaisical, for me, I could never be just there sitting and then kind of get up and pick up a pole and go. I, I didn't have enough emotion behind me, enough adrenaline behind me. So I think as a young athlete, you need to find what works best for you. Um, and I remember going through these stages as a high school athlete. Um, in high school, I was a really good 300 hurdler. And I was the number one girl in Northern California. And I had to go down to the state meet in Southern California. And I'd never seen these girls before. And I get there and I'm totally out of my element. Um, girls that had legs, you know, up, I felt like I was running against gazelles. And... I was scared and I was like, these girls are gonna beat me. They're just, just looking at them. They look so much more athletic. So I defeated myself right then and there because I let the emotions take over. Instead of going, Stacy, you're number one in California. You must have something to prove today and bring to the table. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I went through failures and emotions 
and trying to, you know, go into a meet excited or mad. And, you know, I think it just takes time to develop what works best for you. Um, I would think that I would go in really aggressive and mean, and that's just not the way you throw a discus. You need to be long, you need to be relaxed, but you need to be thinking about hitting the right positions. So I think, I think it just takes time to develop what works best for you. I had a girlfriend um, at Prefontaine, one of our biggest meets here in the US. She'd be really reading a magazine and reading about what, what trends are hitting right now. And I'm like, how could you be looking at, you know, whatever magazine it was, looking at what trends for clothing there are right now. When we have, you know, the number one and number three ranked girl from Europe over here competing against us. Like, is your mind in the right spot? But then she put her magazine away. She did up, she got up, did her, her drills. She got on the runway and she executed. So not everybody, you know, um, deals with, with meat preparation or um, that anxiety or, or the meat day the same way. Cool. I'm going to, uh, sorry, oh, go can I piggyback on that a little bit? Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there's a fine line between, I don't know if anger is the right word, I think aggression is the better word. Uh, I mean, if, if you think about any sport, like if, if you get angry and tight, the adrenaline's flowing, that causes your muscles to tense and you're not going to be as smooth. So whether you're running the pole vault or have a discus in your hand, when you start to tighten up, everything shortens. Your muscle shortens, so you're not getting you're not getting the proper leverage you should be. And there's definitely a fine line between that anger, aggressiveness, and, and being smooth uh, and able to put everything together. I know for me personally, a, a lot of my best throws in my life, like, oh man, that felt so easy. And then you're like, oh, I should just try harder, and then it just goes down from there. So there, there's definitely a fine line, and everybody's different in the way they compete, but it's just through practice, you kind of find what works for you and able just to flip that switch when you get in the ring or on the runway. Now, this last question from Januel is kind of related to that, that previous one. And it says, could some of these gymnastic drills be used for building explosiveness or would it be better to take them slow for proper form? Um. I think yes and no. I think some of the some of the elements, a lot of the elements are, you know, they're speed related, right? So we're we're tapping a swing. I'll, I'll see kids that will think about the swing too much and almost it's 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 too controlled, right? There needs to be a swing, especially on the rings and the rope. Yes, you want to hit proper positions. I think early on when you get a kid on the rings and the rope, you want to go through it a little bit slower. You can manipulate them when they're in the air and, and tell them to squeeze tight and fill that position. But ultimately, you know, you want to emulate what you're trying to do on the runway as well. So I think there's a trade-off. I think early on, I think it's okay to go a little bit slower. I think when you're trying to do a handstand to a forward roll, I don't know how much slower you can, you know, slow it down. Sometimes I will grab my athlete and try to hit them in a proper position in the handstand and then try to lower them down, especially for a lot of my guys that, would keep a flat back and then just, you know, hit the ground so hard. I would teach them slowly, like, you got to tuck your chin to your chest. You need to arch your back so you're rounded. Okay, I'm dropping you down. You're rolling. But um, over time, I think just playing and seeing other kids, I think the big thing is if you have a gymnast in your group, let that person be your leader. Let them show proper technique. And then over time, I think those kids start to, you know, do a little bit better, morph into that position. I think, I think there's a little bit of give and take. So that was, that was a really great question. Cool. All right. I just got another one in from, uh, for Ian. It's, this is from Renee. <clears throat> Ian, how far apart should your front and back feet be at the start of a shot? Um, it's, it's, they're pretty close, actually. In the starting position, you have a flat front right foot. And then the left foot is, is directly behind the right foot with just the toe on the ground. Um, and I can get with Brennan later and, and tell him about that. But yeah, it's, it's okay. not much distance there because you have to get a long kick with that left leg. So you want it pretty close to the right foot. All right, cool. So now those are all of the questions that I've gotten in via the chat and via email, unless somebody sent some to you two 
via the Stacy Dragila at gmail.com. I'll look. Okay. We'll uh, check on our phones real quick and see. Yeah, check you your phones. And while you're doing that, I'm going to send uh, some of our favorite questions in to Jason, who's going to be uh, giving away prizes and stuff. Awesome. Stacy, I see one from Emma in the chat. Okay. And it, it says, what are some good drills or tips for getting deeper into the pit during the vault, during a vault? Okay, well, like I talked about, the run-up is the most important. I know we didn't talk about the, that today. Um, I wanted to go off on a, you know, on a different thing, and I hope it was um, useful. But the run-up is crucial, right? So if, if we're running up and either we're holding too high or we're slowing down into the takeoff, that could limit how deep we get into the pit. So I think early on, I'm not sure where your athlete's running from, but even when I start kids, I start from a one-step, and that's – that's a right left from the box. So we'll we'll step in there, we'll get our step, we'll take a right left back, and then we'll rock back and we'll go right left into the pit. Um, learning from that step and then adding on to those steps as we move back. But if if you're not penetrating, either you're not hitting your top arm to get that pull to move to vertical, or you're not running through the takeoff, or potentially there's just a lot of things you could be under at takeoff you could be out at takeoff if i don't see a video i i don't know exactly how the app is well well if the pole is not moving to vertical then the kid is probably either holding too high for his ability or her ability to run down the runway so play around with grip grip height gripping down two or three fingers can really help that pole roll to vertical and help accelerate that athlete into the pit and then once they feel that position then the grip can come back up, the step can move back, and then you can add another stride to the to the run up. I hope I hope that was some good information. All right. Anything else? I didn't. I, think, I didn't I see one, anything. I think one more question uh, from uh, Gomez here. Fun question for you both. What was your favorite competition or experience? Um, I actually probably have two. I, I think for me, the 2008 Olympic trials when I won was probably one of my favorite uh, competitions, not only because I won and made my second Olympic team, uh, just, just the crowd at Hayward Stadium there was just, they brought in all the extra stands and the crowd was awesome. The family was there. Um, so that, that was a great competition. And then uh, in 2005, we had world championships in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, that was probably my favorite because uh, it's probably my best competition internationally, and I ended up getting fifth, which it's not a gold medal like Stacy has, but uh, for me it was a big accomplishment. And then, um, and then that's where Stacy and I met. Also, it was in Helsinki, so that's Aww. kind of a <laughs> special place uh, for me. So those are my couple ones. I think um, for me. Gosh, I mean, I've, I've been able, you know, I and I have been able to compete all over the world. And for me to be able to see the world, you know, on somebody else's dime has been pretty, pretty amazing, right? So we've been to so many different countries and experiences have been so different. I think obviously winning my gold medal in Sydney, um, just the fanfare that was around that whole Olympics. They called it Olympic Village because so many different events were in one area. So when you leave the track, you're really close to the swimming complex, which you're close to the volleyball, you know, complex. And so tons of fans and spectators were just kneeling around and the energy was just electric, electrifying, um, fine there. And then, you know, winning my medal there and getting it placed around my neck, you know, well after midnight um, and then going to... Um, I had to go to media and then I had to go produce a sample. And then my family was literally outside of this, the stadium at a, a local tavern wait, waiting to celebrate with me. Um, I was leaving, trying to leave the stadium after I produced my sample, we were trying to get out of the stadium. There was nobody there to escort me because it took me so long to produce the sample. We thought, oh, we'll just walk out this door and, and go through another door and get to the tavern and celebrate with my family. It literally took us 20 minutes to try to find a door that was open still in the stadium. 
cleaners had already come and cleaned and doors were locked. Um, the corridors were all shut. We went up and down elevators to find another door to exit. And finally we come around a corner and I see light and I'm like, oh gosh, we can finally get out. We approach this door and there are big doors that open and it was the garbage room where they had hauled in all the garbage bags with half eaten hot dogs and empty beer bottles and, and everything. But I could see that there was a fence and I could see that the tavern was out around the corner. And I looked at my manager and I said, we're doing it. He goes, we're doing what? I said, we're walking over the garbage. And I was thinking, I'm wearing my Olympic medal and we had to find pieces of cardboard to place in front of our steps so we didn't step on these, you know, bags of garbage and ketchup and spilled everywhere. And so it was me, my manager and his best friend had been walking over this pile of garbage and I'm at the peak of the garbage and I can see the fence that I'm going to climb, you know, to get out. And all of a sudden I hear behind me, uh, 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 and Peter's friend fell in the sea of garbage. <laughs> and I tell people that I forget that, you know, that happened that night, but you know, I didn't have the red carpet rolled out for me after I won my medal. I walked across all this garbage to get out to my family. So that was, that was a pretty crazy, memorable event. And then I think sometimes going to the, the smaller um, local, um, um, the smaller events, we were on the island of Crete where it's a small village and the meat director had invited me several years. I'd been going for like seven years and I got to watch his kids grow up and they would come hang out with me in my hotel room during the day, we'd play Uno and cards and sit around and talk and walk around the local village and eat lunch in these amazing little cafes that these kids knew as family members. Um, it's those little things along the way and it's the people for me along the way that that made my journey so so special and memorable. And um, you know, now the daughter, Virginia is getting married this year and I'm hoping to go back to to watch her get married on the island of Crete. So it's, it's an island off of Athens and um, just, just, you know, getting to know people, I think has been huge for me. So the experiences along the way have, have, you know, touched my heart and stayed with me. All right, anybody else have any good questions or ideas or anything? I'm looking at my screens and all that. I've got one for, uh, for the two of you from our, it's kind of the general question. And it's in regards to the, uh, the specialization of athletes that you, we've seen over the last, I'd say even a couple of decades where kids are kind of specializing in either soccer or basketball or whatever their individual sport is. And I'd kind of like to get your views on, on that specialization and, or in cross training in general, because both of you obviously had different sports that you were involved with when you were growing up. So just getting in curious, I'm curious what you think about the specialization that seems to be happening. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I feel about it. Obviously, we, we grew up in kind of a different area, and it seems like there's more pressure on kids to do well earlier. Uh, my thought is, is, is every sport you're going to cross train in, and the main thing is you, you don't know what you're going to be good at, right? I mean, you could be a, a one-sport person, but maybe you, like if I just stuck with football and I never did track, then who knows if I would have been good at that, so... I think being able to do those other sports not only helps you in your main sport, but you might find a new love or something that you you really yeah. excel in that you could get a scholarship or be make the Olympics or whatever it may be. So I I think that kids kids should venture out into other sports and you know maybe that's the parents, maybe that I don't know who it is, but maybe it's a school. But I think these kids need to take a break for one so they don't get burnout for two you know, maybe they'll excel really well in a, in a different sport. Yeah, that's kind of what, what I tell my kids too. Even though I run club, I want my kids to be athletic first, you know, because if you're not athletic, it's going to be really hard to do this event. And um, I, I also train my kids over hurdles. They're like, well, I'm not a hurdler. And I'm like, well, it's going to make you a better athlete. We, we also train long jump at my gym. I'm not a long jump. I'm like, well, it's going to make you a better pole vaulter. And you never know. You might, you might pick up on long jump and might, that might be your first event instead of pole vault. So I like to, I like to do that even in my club situation to throw different things at them, to make them think a little bit differently. And, um, you know, and, you know, there's days that you're, you don't do well in your main event. So it's nice to have something to 
go and do and have a little bit of success. And for me during the multi, you know, my multi career at ISU, there'd be days that my hurdle race was horrible and, you know, but I had X, Y, Z to go work on. And then all of a sudden my long jump was great. So I could have sat around and been really sad about my hurdles, but at least I had another event to go in and, and work on. And the great thing is that those things really played a huge role into my success as a pole vaulter. So I try to tell my kids, it's, it's good to be multi-talented right now. I want you to be on the track team when you're in high school and do more than just a pole vault. Because like Ian said, you might think this is your event, but you might excel at another event. And it's, it's all about that cross training. If you do one event for too long, you could jeopardize burning out. And, you know, you want to be able to do this for as long as you want to do it and not either one get hurt or burn out. So I think having that diversity is huge. And, you know, I do think that the clubs are really pushing kids to focus and to be a part of that event or that sport for the whole year. And I just, I think it's, it's really bad. And, you know, we have kids now and we're all about just trying a lot of different things. And then hopefully they come and tell us what they really, really, really want to do. And right now, some things they don't want to do, but I'm like, oh, you have to finish it, you know, finish it. And then, you know, as you get older and more mature, then you can try to, you know, narrow your focus. But right now, as a young athlete, it's just all about cross training and just get your body athletic. All right. We got the, about four minutes left. I just got a new one in for Ian. It says, for Ian, at what age did you start track and field slash throwing? Um. Yeah, so I started my freshman year. I grew up in a really small town, so they didn't have track and field. So uh, when we moved to northern Idaho, uh, I was just walking down the hall one day, and the track coach came out. He's like, hey, you should come out for throwing. So I started my freshman year, and from then, uh, had a great high school coach. Uh, stay hour to two hours later when all the other kids went home, and he would help me just uh, just help me create my, my form and technique and drills. And so I was really blessed to have a good good high school coach so yeah I, I started my freshman year and then uh yeah by my senior year I had the first to throw in the country so you never know it can happen that's and it's still there now <laughs> uh, <laughs> Stacy what what about you when you first started getting into things well I um really high school I mean I did a little bit of gymnastics at the YMCA when I was really young I did baton twirling. Um, my big thing was I was in 4-H and FFA and rodeo. That kept me pretty busy. Um, middle school, I played volleyball. And then when I went into high school, I played volleyball. I ran track. I did cross-country skiing to get ready for track season because my track coach was the cross-country ski coach, and he knew that I needed endurance for the 300 hurdles. So I was mentored along a lot like I and just, you know, people watching and, you know, telling me to, you know, just be athletic. and and you know, like Ian said, we weren't, I wasn't pulled, he wasn't pulled to go do one thing. When I was in high school, I did both the relays. I, I ran both the hurdles. Sometimes I long jumped. Um, so I, I was well diversified. So then when, when Coach Dave from Idaho State came calling, I had all these, you know, things in my background. He goes, well, you're not awesome at one thing, but you're really good at a lot of things. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> and I didn't start pole vaulting until I was 23. But because I had that great athletic background, it was a great door opener for me. And I never got sick of my training once I stepped into the pole vault and started, you know, training the gymnastics. So that was new to my regimen. So I was never overtrained. It was always fun for me. I was able to train for 15 years. And I never went into practice going, I hate what I do, you know, yeah. and I would never want an athlete, you know, or a young athlete to feel that they hate what they do because they've been doing it for so long. The only thing that I hated sometimes was the warm up, you know, because we'd have to warm up a certain way to get ready. But, you know, sometimes they would even bring a, a soccer ball down to the field and say, we're just, we're warming up playing soccer today. And I was like, what? And it was got my heart rate up. We started running. And pretty soon I did a couple of running drills and I was on the runway. So he was really great about keeping it fun, keeping it fresh. And I just really enjoyed my journey. Oh, that is so great. Yeah. What a great recap. Well, thank you for this awesome session. I think they're going to uh, put us back to the uh, final session here in a bit. But I definitely want to thank you and, and all the people that submitted questions. And, and uh, I think that this is going to automatically 
leave us back over there. Just... Okay. Well, thanks, Kevin, for leading the Q&A. We appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> thanks for having us. Yes, Train thanks. hard, work hard. Yes. Learn. Reach out to us. <laughs> thanks, guys. I think they, they will take us there in a couple of minutes, or you can, I think, if you hit down at the bottom of your uh, Zoom, you'll see that leave room. I think if you leave the room, that takes you back to the... Okay. The main session as well. All right, I'll I'll do that. I hope I don't go away too far. <laughs> if you do, jump back on. Okay. <laughs>